Thank you for listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We will now continue with Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Now, before I begin the show, I just want to mention, if you've been listening to Radio Maria for, you know, any minutes at all, you'll, uh, this today, you'll realize that we are in the middle, well, we're not, actually not in the middle of the Maria Thon of a fundraising drive. We're at the very, very end of it. I believe it's going to end at the end of my show, so this is your last chance to get in. Uh, the number to call to make a pledge or a donation is 888 408 zero two zero one and I encourage you to do so and I have no selfish interest in this because I am not paid a penny. I've had the show on now since two thousand and thirteen I believe, so seven years. Radio Maria called me up or actually I think sent me an email um the uh the director at the time and he asked if I would be willing to do uh, I think it's seven part series or a twelve part series on the Jewish roots of the church. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll never have enough material to fill seven shows or 12 shows. But here I am seven years later. And about, what's that make it? About 300 shows later. So anyway, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to um, preach and educate, I guess is the right word. Uh, and it's only made possible by contributors and uh, I have no selfish interest because I haven't been paid a penny in those seven years for doing the show. But uh, I look forward to my reward in heaven for uh, any good that gets done by the show. And if you contribute to Radio Maria, of course, you should do it out of the goodness of your heart and to, for the greater glory of God. But you also will get a reward in heaven for any good, any conversion that takes place through the work of Radio Maria, which you help support. So, if I'm allowed to say so, once a Jew, always a Jew, there really is something in it for you, because you'll be getting an annuity for all eternity for the good that you do by contributing to Radio Maria. So, that's my Jewish sales pitch before I start the show. I was going to um, dedicate today's show, or, or make the topic of today's show, a saint that isn't very well known, Saint Claude de la Colombière, a French saint from the uh, middle of the 17th century. We're very, very wealthy in the Catholic Church because we have thousands and thousands of saints. No one could possibly know all the saints. It's not just two or three or four or five dozen or the maybe 200 that have churches and parishes named after them, but it's thousands and thousands and um, St. Claude de Colombier is definitely not one of the top-tier well-known saints, but he is a very real saint, and he's written very, very, very beautiful, uh, wisdom-filled, inspirational writings and prayers. So, I'll just launch in. First of all, I'll, I'll actually do it backwards. He's most famous, Claude de Colombier is most famous, for having been the spiritual director of Margaret Mary Alacoc. Who was she? She was the absolute nothing, poor, ignorant nun who received the sacred heart apparitions. Also in the middle of the 17th century, Jesus appeared to her and showed her his sacred heart and uh, ordered her, actually, to spread devotion to the sacred heart. And... If you're a serious Catholic, you're well aware of the Sacred Heart devotion, of how many Catholic homes have a picture, an image of the Sacred Heart. You see statues all over the place of Jesus with, uh, like this, um, uh, I don't want to say wound, but, you know, with his chest opened up and you can look into the red of his chest and you can see the heart that has either rays coming out of it or is crowned with thorns. And he's looking very loving and welcomingly to you. And it's to spur devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the encouragement for us to not only love Jesus, but recognize 
how much Jesus loves us as evidenced by his willingness to undergo his passion and death for us, to redeem us from our sins. So that's the Sacred Heart devotion. That's St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who was the nun to whom the revelations occurred and who spread the devotion. And Claude de la Colombière was her spiritual director. And in fact, because Margaret Mary was an ignorant, uninfluential, actually not very much liked nun in her convent, the devotion wouldn't have gone anywhere without a promoter who carried a lot of weight. And Claude de Colombier was kind of the opposite of St. Margaret Mary. He was, he was from a very wealthy, noble, aristocratic family. And he was actually, I can't say friends with, but he was uh, well known by and was certainly a, an acquaintance with King Louis XIV, who was the king of France. He traveled in the same circles. And so when Claude de la Colombière threw his, threw his weight behind Margaret Mary Alacoque and her visions or her apparitions, it really enabled the Sacred Heart devotion to take off and become what it has today. So anyway, I don't want to waste much time, maybe four or five minutes on his biography, so to speak. As I mentioned, well, he was born in 1641 to a very wealthy, noble, aristocratic family. He uh, started going to a Jesuit school, grammar school, actually, at the age of 10, and stayed at that school until he was 17, um, and uh, was had a very positive response to the Jesuits. And when he was 17, he asked to be admitted to the Jesuits. And so he was admitted as a as a, um, I don't know what the technical term is, as a novice, I think. I don't think it was a postulant in those days. And eventually he, he became a full-fledged Jesuit and was ordained as a priest. And you know, along the way, he studied a lot at um, university. And so he also became a professor. And then uh, in... Uh, 1674, so when he was uh, 33, he took his final vows as a Jesuit. It takes about 10, 12 years uh, to go through the Jesuits. And uh, when he took his final vows and became a full-fledged Jesuit, uh, he had been a priest for a number of years by then, he was assigned to Paray le Monial, which was the town where St. Margaret Mary Alacoque was in a convent there. And it was rather strange that such a intellectual, academic, well-respected Jesuit priest should be assigned to a little backwater town uh, and as the chaplain of a simply, you know, small run-of-the-mill visitation convent. And the general understanding is he was sent there precisely because the Jesuit superiors had heard of Margaret Mary and didn't know what to make of her and wanted someone who, with good discernment and good authority, to take a look at the situation and evaluate it and figure out what to do. So Claude de la Colombia was sent there, and he was uh, bought into, let's say, very quickly, Margaret Mary. All the signs were very good. Um, the, the fact that she was receiving these apparitions did not make her proud at all or lessen her humility at all. Uh, if anything, it might have increased her humility. She didn't make any, you know, d didn't take on any self-importance, didn't take on any, you know, I'm something special at all. And her behavior, her submission to obedience, which is really the acid test for religious, um, and as I said, her humility and, and faithfulness to the rule and everything, actually helped convince Claude de Colombier that this was for real. Uh, at one point, Claude de Colombier gave her a test to make sure. And he told St. Margaret Mary, if it's really Jesus who's appearing to you, then the next time he appears to you, ask him what my last serious sin was. And that way I'll know that it's for real and it's really him, if he can give you the answer. So the next time Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary, 
she somewhat abashedly said, you know, well, my spiritual director has asked me to ask you what his last serious sin was. And Jesus' response was, tell him, I don't know, I forgot it because he confessed it. And when Margaret Mary repeated this answer to Claude de la Colombière, he knew that it really was Jesus. Uh, on the In the other direction, Margaret Mary Alacoque knew that Claude de Colombier was sent by Jesus because she was actually told before he arrived that um, he was, she was told by Jesus himself before de Colombier arrived that Jesus was going to send her finally a spiritual director who could really help her and who could also help with the Sacred Heart devotion, getting it spread. So, uh, and then, and then when Claude Colombier appeared, when Margaret Mary saw him for the first time, Jesus told her interiorly, this is the one whom I send to you. And then the first time Margaret Mary went to confession to him, he, she was absolutely confirmed that he was sent by Jesus to be her director and guide as he was for the rest of his short life. Because after a sh relatively short time, between one and two years, in Pere le Monial, Claude Cormier was sent to England to be the chaplain to uh, um, the, du the, du excuse me, the Duchess of York, who was uh, a Italian princess who married the Duke of York, who the Duke of York was going to become king in his turn, and he became King James. So Claude de Colombier was sent to be the chaplain to the Catholic future queen, and he lived in, at St. James. He lived at the um, uh, you know royal palace. But um, r remember, at this time, it was illegal to be Catholic in England, essentially, Hundreds and hundreds of Catholic priests have been horribly tortured and killed for refusing to submit to Henry VIII as the head of the church. In other words, for insisting to remain Catholic and not becoming Anglican. And uh, as a matter of fact, priests were being hunted and they were being uh, killed, executed, con condemned to death with the most horrible forms of execution if they were caught celebrating Mass. And into this maelstrom goes Claude de Colombier to be the official cha Catholic chaplain to essentially the Queen-to-be. It didn't last too long, and um, he got caught up in the anti-Catholic, I don't want to say hysteria, the anti-Catholic legal system, in fact, and he was uh, condemned but the King Louis of France, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, was the King of France, who, as I mentioned, was friends with him, interceded with the uh, with the British Crown, and uh, managed to get Claude de Colombier released and sent back to France. But only after he had spent some time in a medieval prison, a horrible conditions, needless to say, and his health never recovered, and he died. He died about two years later from the, um, the horrible health. He uh, started out with tuberculosis and went downhill from there that um, he got when he was in England. So he is sometimes considered a martyr for that reason because his death was directly linked to his um, imprisonment as a Catholic priest in England. So that's his biography. Now I get to the fun part, which is his spirituality. But before I do, let me remind you, uh, by my calculation, you only have 45 minutes left to make a donation during the Mariathon. And if you wish to, you can do so by calling 888-408-0201. That's 888-408-0201. And make a donation or a pledge. Uh, or I'm sure that if you pull up the Radio Maria website, that's radiomaria.us, you will both find the number to call to contribute there, 
and you can um, directly make the contribution via the website radiomaria.us or you can go to the Radio Maria US Facebook page. And as long as I'm saying all of that, let me also add that if you have a smartphone, and who doesn't nowadays, you can download for free, of course, the Radio Maria app from either the Android market, if you have an Android, or the uh, App Store, if you have an Apple. And that way you can have Radio Maria on your phone, um, either in your car or when you're at home. So I encourage you to do that. I know I make use of that. Um, it's hard enough to find worthwhile things to listen to while driving. Um, it's nice to have the alternative of just um, using the smartphone and listening to Radio Maria. So that's my little um, advertisement break for the Mariathon at this point. And now let me get to Claude Clomier's spirituality. I think I'll make it easy, which is um, I will I will start with prayers that he wrote, and I'll talk a little bit about the prayers, and I think you'll see why I'm doing that as soon as I read some of the prayers. Um, he was well. Anyway, I'll I'll talk more more um, about it uh, in the context of the prayers. But he had a very, very particular spirituality. He had a very particular psychological profile, let's say, which was he was prone to discouragement and sadness and depression. Um, he wanted to be a Jesuit, even though um, when he applied to the Jesuits, let me uh, pull up the quote, but when he asked to be admitted to the Jesuits, he said, um, uh, he said, uh, boy, where can I find it? My, he said to the uh, Jesuit superior that he was applying to, my father, I have the greatest aversion for the life you describe. That's because the Jesuit superior had just described the life of a Jesuit. Uh, Claude de la Colombia's response was, My father, I have the greatest aversion for the life you describe, yet I would like to become a Jesuit. In other words, his, his, his flesh just, you know, crawled at the idea of the life of a Jesuit. He had been, a, as I mentioned, a wealthy, aristocratic young man. He was very fond of his pleasures. He was fond of fine dining and fine wine. He and, uh, liked to never miss a concert or a theater performance. He was a bit of a dandy. He dressed in, you know, these elaborate, beautiful um, 17th century, you know, aristocratic clothes. He had a very aristocratic bearing. And, um, you know, the idea of living poverty, uh, living without any luxuries and so forth was anathema to him in one way. But as an act of will and because he wanted to love God above all else. He nonetheless wanted to become a Jesuit, and they let him in. So let me uh, read some of his prayers, which actually reflect um, uh, reflect this uh, spirituality of this. Okay, this is a prayer in, uh, it's an act of confidence, an act of trust in God, if you listen closely, you'll find a lot of resonances with St. Faustina or what Jesus teaches Faustina about how what pleases Jesus the most is for people to have confidence in him. So this is St. Claude de la Colombière's prayer of confidence in Jesus. My God, I am so convinced that you keep watch over those who hope in you and that one can want for nothing if one looks to you for all things, that I am resolved to live in the future without any concerns, to give all my worries to you, to live free from every care, and to turn all my anxieties over to you. Quote, In peace I sleep and I rest, for thou, O Lord, alone are my hope. Close quote, Psalm 4. Men may strip me of possessions and of honor, Sickness may ruin my strength and my means of serving you. I may even lose your grace by sin. 
but never shall I lose my hope. I will keep it to the last moment of my life, and all the demons of hell will at that moment make but vain efforts to tear it from me, for it is in peace I sleep and rest. Others may look for their happiness from their wealth or their talents. Others may rely on the innocence of their life, or the rigor of their penances, or the size of their alms, or the fervor of their prayers. But thou, O Lord, alone are my hope. As for me, Lord, all my confidence is in my confidence itself. This confidence has never deceived anyone. Quote, no one, no one who has hoped in the Lord has been confounded. Close quote, Ecclesiastes 2. Now this last sentence that I read is to me the heart of this prayer and the heart of the genius of this prayer. As for me, Lord, all my confidence is in my confidence itself. In other words, the only, the only rock he has, the only absolute firm foundation is his trust in Jesus, his confidence in Jesus. He is fully aware that he may sin and lose a state of grace, but his confidence in Jesus is sufficient so that he's confident that whatever hole he gets himself into, with good will, Jesus will help him get out of. If we have that confidence that Jesus is there, that Jesus loves us, that Jesus wants our salvation, not as much as we do, but more than we do, then that confidence itself becomes the rock of Gibraltar. Continuing with the prayer. I am thus assured that I shall be eternally happy, since I firmly hope to be, and because it is from you, O God, that I hope it. Quote, In thee, O Lord, do I seek refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In thy righteousness deliver me. Psalm 31. I know, alas, I know only too well that I am weak and inconstant. I know what temptations can do against the firmest virtues. I have seen the stars of heaven and the pillars of the firmament fall, but all that cannot frighten me. As long as I hope, I will be sheltered from all misfortunes, because I still hope with this unchanging hope. Alas, I know only too well that I am weak and inconstant. I know what temptations can do against the firmest virtues. I have seen the stars of heaven and the pillars of the firmament fall. Look who fell! Lucifer, right? The number one angel, number two angel, I'm not sure, but way up there, you know, right? You know, best buddies with God, he fell. All of the other fallen angels, uh, and it was one third of all of the angels fell with him. Um, the angels are far more intelligent than we are. We know that the devil is after us. We know that the fallen angels are after us. Um, if we were to rely on our own resistance to temptation, we would be goners. Look at what happened to St. Peter when he relied on his own strength to stay faithful to Jesus. St. Claude de Colombier is too wise for that. He's not about to have any confidence in his own ability to avoid sin and avoid falling and avoiding losing his salvation. So what alternative is there? to have confidence in Jesus' ability to lead you through it unscathed and lead you through it to heaven. So as he says, despite having seen the angels fall, it cannot frighten me as long as I hope I will be sheltered from all misfortunes because I still hope with this unchanging hope. Back to the prayer. Finally, I am sure that it is impossible to hope too much in you and that I cannot receive less than I have hoped for from you. Thus, I hope you will hold me safe on the steepest slopes, that you will sustain me against the most furious assaults, and that you will make my weakness triumph over the most fearful of my enemies. I hope that you will love me always, and that I too shall love you without ceasing. And to take all at once my hope, as far as it can go, I hope from you... You yourself, O oh my Creator, in time and in eternity. 
uh, again, this really, this really uh, is saturated with Jesus, I trust in you, and Jesus saying that the only thing that limits the graces he gives a person is their lack of confidence in him. And so, Claudio Alcombier is saying, basically, if I hold on in, to my confidence in Jesus, if I hold on to my hope, I don't have to worry about anything else. As he said, I am sure it is impossible to hope too much in you. Of course, it's absolutely tautologically impossible for us to have too much confidence in Jesus, like that we might overestimate his goodness or overestimate his love or overestimate his omnipotence. Not a chance. It's impossible to hope too much in Jesus. And we cannot receive less than we have hoped for from Jesus. We can receive less you know, than our confidence in Jesus has uh, has asked for. Because, again, in St. Faustina's diary, Jesus says that, that to the extent, you know, to the to the level that you have confidence in me, I will give you my graces. To the, the height in which you have confidence in me, I will give you my graces. And so it is that that is the foundation of Claude de la Colombier's uh, persistence and his, his ability to deal with his own sinfulness and his own failings. And it is, in some sense, his remedy against sadness. Because, of course, if one has faith in Jesus and has confidence in Jesus and has hope in Jesus and knows who Jesus is, then we can be sad for a lot of reasons. But we can't decide that it makes sense to be sad, if you know what I mean. Whenever we're sad, we have to realize, okay, it's okay to be sad. That doesn't mean it makes sense to be sad. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's really rational to be sad, especially if what we're sad about is the circumstances of our lives. So with that, I've come to about the halfway point in the program. So let me uh, again make a little announcement that we are drawing to the close of the Maria Thon. Radio Maria is dependent on these periodic, I think it's spring and fall, um, Maria Thons, you know, fundraising drives in order to keep the lights on. Uh, as I mentioned, the presenters, as far as I know, don't get any payment. Certainly I don't, and none of them that I have spoken to do. Um, there is, of course, a skeleton uh, crew to keep the lights on and keep the machines running and coordinate the broadcast and so forth, um, and, and their professional crew. And there's also all of the overhead of running a radio station and the license and the equipment and all of that. And none of that can be done without funds without money. So if the money dried up completely, Radio Maria would obviously go off the air. So that's why a couple of times a year they have these fundraising drives. And that is why I'm encouraging you to consider prayerfully whether Radio Maria, you know, deserves a place on your, on your list of, um, of, uh, causes that you support in order to give glory and honor to God and in order, in the end, to save souls from hell. Because really, in the end, that's the chips we're playing for. In the end, we're praying, we're playing for the salvation of souls. God wants every soul to be saved. The devil wants every soul to be lost. And we want to do everything we can to increase the pile of chips in front of God on the poker table and to diminish the pile of chips in front of the devil at that poker table. And that's the business Radio Maria's in. That's the business I'm in. And I hope and pray that that's the business that you're in. And so with that, we've come to the halfway point in the program. So we'll take a short break, short music break. And when we come back, I will continue with St. Claude de Colombier, our saint for the day. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Showman, on to the break. Hi, welcome back. You're listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church. Although today's show is more on a saint, a kind of favorite saint of mine, um, St. Claude de la Colombière. 
And you're also listening to the show at the very tail end of the biannual um, uh, fundraising drive for Radio Maria. So again, I encourage you, if you enjoy uh, the availability of Radio Maria, if you enjoy listening, and uh, most importantly, if you think that it is um, doing God a service, is doing God a service by bringing people closer to God, and putting them on the path to heaven, then I encourage you to contribute. You can contribute by calling 888-408-0201. That's the Radio Maria contribution line, 888-408-0201. Or just go to radiomaria.us, the website, and you can find the phone number there, and you can also make a donation directly uh, through the website. And if you call in, if uh, I understand correctly, there will be some premiums or, or prizes or gifts that are associated with, associated with various levels of giving. So there might be something appealing on the side to get. But of course, if you have an eye to what you're going to get out of this, what you're going to get out of this is more merit in heaven for all eternity maybe even some merit on earth to help you get to heaven. So it's a very good deal to uh, support endeavors that need charitable contributions in order, order to continue serving God. Okay, back to Claude de la Colombière's prayers. As I said, Claude de Colombier was, um, had a tendency towards discouragement and sadness and depression. And then when he was sent to England... The circumstances were even worse because, of course, he was very much in enemy territory. Uh, he had a lot of priest friends who were caught and killed. And he also had an uncomfortable living situation even before he was sent to prison. He was used to living in peaceful, clean countryside, and he was living in London in the days when the only heat was coal stoves and the air was, you know, was black with coal smoke and um, he suffered badly from, essentially from the pollution uh, in the air from the coal and um, ended up coming down with tuberculosis and in prison, of course, things took a nosedive for the worse. So, so he was, uh, he needed a friend, let's put it this way, he needed a friend. And he only wanted one friend, and he only looked in one direction for his friend, and of course, that is Jesus. So let me read his prayer to his only friend, Jesus. O oh, Jesus, you are my only and true friend. You take a part in all my misfortunes. You take them on to yourself. You know how to turn them to the good. You listen to me with kindness when I recount to you my troubles, and you never fail to lessen them. I find you always and everywhere. You never distance yourself from me, and if I have to move, I never fail to find you wherever I go. You are never bored listening to me. You never fail to do good for me. I am assured of being loved if I love you. That in itself is worth pondering. We all want to be loved. Many of us have had very, very uh, dark periods in our life because we have felt that no one loves us and that we're not loved. And yet, we are assured of being loved if we love Jesus. We are, in fact, assured of being loved more than we could ever hope for if we love God. Back to Claude de Colombier. I am assured of being loved if I love you. You do not need my goods, and you do not impoverish yourself at all in giving me yours. However miserable I may be, a more noble, a more beautiful spirit, or even a holier spirit, would not take your friendship from me in the least. And death, which tears us away from all other friends, will only unite me with you. All the humiliations of old age or fortune cannot separate you from me. On the contrary, I will never enjoy you more fully. You will never be closer to me. 
than when everything opposes me the most. You suffer my faults with admirable patience. Even my infidelities and ingratitudes not, do not hurt you to the point that you are not always willing to return to me if I so wish. O oh, Jesus, grant me the desire to be entirely yours for time and for all eternity. You know, again, if we turn to Jesus... In a sense, we can want for nothing more. We are we are lacking nothing. There's nothing missing if if we direct ourselves towards Jesus. Um, nothing can separate us from Jesus if we if we unite ourselves with Him. Um, and even death, which separates us from everybody else, will only be the ultimate union with Jesus. Even our faults and our sins. Don't separate us from Jesus for long if we turn to him, right? He's always willing and eager to forgive a repentant heart. That's probably, I don't want to say it's the biggest theme in the Gospels of his parables, but certainly a huge theme in what he spoke in the uh, Gospels, you know, the parables that are written down. We see it, of course, in the prodigal son. We see it in the shepherd who leaves 99 good sheep to go in search of the stray sheep um, and so forth and so on. Um, nothing nothing makes heaven rejoice more than the return of a sinner. So really, you know, if we keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our, our, our compass pointed to Jesus, so to speak, then, then nothing can go wrong. And there's absolutely not, I mean, then there's nothing else to be concerned about. Anyway, I shouldn't bog down in my own words because St. Claude de Colombier's words and thoughts are so much clearer, so let me go back to his prayers. Now, as I mentioned, he was the Apostle of the Sacred Heart, along with St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. So here is a prayer to the Sacred Heart of Jesus for forgetfulness of self. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Teach me perfect forgetfulness of self, since that is the only path by which one can enter into you. Since all that I shall do in the future will be for you, grant that I may do nothing that is unworthy of you. Teach me what I must do to arrive at the purity of your love, the desire for which you have inspired in me. I feel in myself a great desire to please you, and yet a great inability to do so, without a great light and special help, which I can only get from you. Do in me your will, Lord. I oppose it, I know well, but I very much want, it seems to me, not to oppose it. It is up to you to do it all, divine heart of Jesus Christ. You alone will have all the glory of my sanctification if I make myself a saint. That seems clearer than day to me, but it will be for you a great glory, and it's for that alone that I want to desire to be perfect. Amen. This is a, a, such a beautiful prayer in so many ways. First of all, remember Claude Colombier was a religious, um, you know, he was a Jesuit. And one of the pitfalls of religious life is wanting to be holy out of pride, out of vainglory, out of self-seeking, to want to make oneself a saint or become a saint, um, out of self-interest, and especially out of vainglory, in other words, out of pride. And uh, Claude de Colombia was very aware of that pitfall. In fact, he wrote, he wrote in his spiritual journal a lot uh, he, he recognized that as his, as his biggest temptation was spiritual vainglory, was taking pride in his apostolate and pride in, in his um, spiritual advancement and so forth. And so this prayer has this very, very beautiful thought that yes, he wants to be a saint, but he only wants to be a saint for the glory of Jesus. He only wants to be a saint because that will glorify Jesus. He only wants to be a saint because Jesus wants him to be a saint. 
he doesn't want any self-interest in his own sanctification. Number one. I'll read this prayer again afterwards, after I've talked about some of the elements in it. Uh, The other thing that's very beautiful in here is, you know, we all know we're supposed to say, Thy will be done. We all know we're supposed to say, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll know that even when we say, but not my will, but thy will be done, most of the time, at least in my case, we don't really mean it. We feel that, let's say, let's say we have a test for cancer. You know, we go in and we have a biopsy and we're waiting three days to find the results of the biopsy. You know, and we're praying fervently, Jesus, let it not be cancer. Jesus, let it not be cancer. Jesus, let it not be cancer. Nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, how many of us really mean, nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done? In other words, if it's better for you that I have a horrible cancer, then I don't want you to take it away. You know, in a slight way, we might mean it, but like 99% of us doesn't mean it. And Claude de Colombier is honest enough in his looking into his soul to recognize that, that he actually doesn't want God's will to be done. He wants his own will to be done. He knows it. So all he can pray for is to get to the point where he means it for real. Does that make sense? I hope it made sense. Because I think that is this, this magic key this to the spiritual life. Um, that if we're not able to do something, we pray for the ability to be able to. Definitely don't be a hypocrite and pretend to be doing it when you can't. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but I, there was a family member that I found it extremely difficult, almost, I mean, I found it impossible to forgive this family member. Um, I was so, so, so hurt. And as hard as I tried to forgive her, I'll reveal the gender at least, um, I couldn't. So since I couldn't forgive her, I prayed that I would come to the point where I could forgive her. And it worked eventually. It wasn't quick. It might have been a couple of years, but now I really do forgive her. It took years. Um, if I had pretended to forgive her rather than praying for the ability to forgive her, I probably never would have been able to forgive her. And we know that another constant theme of Jesus in the Gospels is we can't expect forgiveness if we have any forgiveness in our own hearts towards anyone. It's even in the Our Father, in the prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a contract. It's a condition. Our trespasses are forgiven if and only if we forgive others. You know, we could be sending ourselves to hell by having unforgiveness towards someone in our heart. And that has nothing to do with how badly they offended us. Because however badly they offended us, it doesn't hold a candle to how badly we have offended God, given his perfection and his perfect goodness uh, and his holiness. Remember that beautiful parable of the rich man who forgives a huge debt of somebody who turns around and refuses to forgive a tiny debt by one of his servants. And then the rich man says, when he hears of it, because you haven't forgiven that small debt when I forgave you your huge debt, you can forget about my having forgiven your good debt and uh, I'm going to throw you in prison until the last penny is paid, which of course is impossible. And basically, Jesus is telling this parable about us. So he's basically saying that being thrown in prison until the last penny is paid is is being lost, is going to hell. And that is what we are asking for. That's what we're risking if we hold unforgiveness in our own heart. This isn't directly what this prayer is about, but it is um, an implication in this prayer because what Claude Colombier is saying is, Do in me your will, Lord. I oppose it, I know well, but I very much want, it seems to me, not to oppose it. It is up to you to do it all. So, you know, if we can't really embrace God's will, 
if it comes to tremendous suffering for us or for someone we love, then we can at the very least pray to come to a point of accepting God's will, come to a point of desiring God's will rather than our own will. Just like if we can't bring ourselves to forgive someone, we can at least pray for the grace to come to the point where we do want to forgive them. Anyway, it is a it is an incredibly powerful trick, one could say, to um, getting over roadblocks in the spiritual life. So, um, I've babbled for so long, I'm going to reread the prayer. It's only a few sentences from the beginning. Uh, put it back, kind of reassemble it. So, it's um, a prayer to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Here goes, Sacred Heart of Jesus, teach me perfect forgetfulness of self, since that is the only path by which one can enter into you. Since all that I shall do in the future will be for you, grant that I may do nothing that is unworthy of you. Teach me what I must do to arrive at the purity of your love, the desire for which you have inspired in me. I feel in myself a great desire to please you and a great inability to succeed without a great light and a special help, which I can only get from you. Do in me your will, Lord. I oppose it, I know well, but I very much want, it seems to me, to not oppose it. It is up to you to do it all, divine heart of Jesus Christ. You alone will have all the glory of my sanctification if I make myself a saint. That seems clearer than day, but it will be for you a great glory, and it is for that alone that I want to desire to be perfect. Amen. You know, this this prayer is so much like the other prayer of confidence in Jesus, because everything everything that's saying, that Claude de Colombier is saying here is, I can do nothing, I can do nothing, I can do nothing. All I can do is ask you to do it in me, ask you to give me forgetfulness of self, ask me to give me the desire to love you, ask me the, uh, ask you to give me the desire to do your will, and so forth and so on. You know, we are we are totally helpless in the spiritual life, except except the only the only tool we have is asking God to help us. That's it, and this that just permeates uh, Claude de Colombier's introspections and his prayers. I will continue to the extent I have time here. Maybe I'll put in one second to last plug that yes, the, we're in the last few minutes of the Maria Thon of the fundraising drive for this fall on Radio Maria. And if you wish to support the work of Radio Maria, or if you think that God would like you to support the work on Radio Maria, ask him first. <laughs> I don't presume that he does. I don't know that he does. I don't want to get in trouble for putting words in his mouth, but ask him and ask your heart whether he does. And if you think he might, you might think of calling the contribution number for the Mariathon, which is 888-408-0201, or go to the Radio Maria website, radiomaria.us. Okay, I probably only have time. Maybe I have time for two more of these prayers. Okay. I've also been beating the drum in this show about how closely Claude Colombier's spirituality echoes the spirituality that Jesus later revealed to St. Faustina in the first half of the 20th century, the Divine Mercy devotion. So Claude de Colombier, Claude de la Colombier, has a um, prayer that revolves around showing God's mercy. So here goes. Lord, I am in this world to show your mercy to others. Other people will glorify you by making visible the power of your grace in their fidelity and constancy to you. For my part, I will glorify you by making known how good you are to sinners, that your mercy is boundless, and that no sinner, no matter how great his offenses, should have reason to despair of forgiveness. If I have grievously offended you, my Redeemer, let me not offend you even more by thinking that you are not kind enough to pardon me. Amen.
I don't have the citation, but Jesus says exactly the same thing to St. Faustina, that that the most offensive thing to him is if a sinner thinks that if he turned to Jesus and asked for forgiveness, Jesus would not forgive him. That nothing is more offensive to Jesus' goodness. Nothing is more contrary to faith in Jesus and understanding Jesus' love than thinking that he wouldn't forgive us no matter what our sins if we turn to him with genuine contrition. I hope this doesn't apply to any of you out there, but if it does, take advantage of it. Go to confession. It doesn't matter how many people you killed. It doesn't matter if you killed your own child. If you're sorry for it, don't be like you know Judas Iscariot and simply give in to despair and hide from God. Hiding from God doesn't work too well, you know, because there is no hiding from God anyway. Um, but if you instead turn to God and trust in his mercy and trust in his love for you and trust in the power of his precious blood and trust in the infinite value of the sacrifice he made on Calvary and the infinite reservoir of graces and of atonement that he earned for the entire church for all time in his sacrifice on Calvary. Just turn to him and ask for forgiveness, and if you're a Catholic, of course, make use of the power of the sacrament of confession, of reconciliation. Oh, boy. Uh, Comparisons are odious, but I think one could suggest that the sacrament of confession is second... Oh, gosh, I don't know. Is it second only to baptism? Is it second to baptism and to the Eucharist? I don't know, but it is way up there. I mean, if you can, if you can wrap your mind around the power of the sacrament of reconciliation, that there is a guarantee that if you have true contrition and you go to the sacrament of confession and you confess your sin, you will be absolved of that sin. That sin will be washed away by the blood of Jesus that he shed on Calvary. What could what could possibly keep us from making use of that sacrament of going to him? Anyway, I've run out of time. Uh, thank you for listening. I uh, hope to have time in the near future to continue with some more wisdom of Claude de Colombier. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Shoman. And as I close, let me remind you, that there are only a few minutes left during this Mariathon to make a contribution. If you wish to do so, the number is 888-408-0201 or go to the Radio Maria website, radiomaria.us. And with that, let me say goodbye, or at least goodbye for now, and I hope to see you again next week, same time, same place, on Radio Maria, Jesus the Promised Messiah of Judaism. With me, your host, Roy Shoman, and with that, bye for now.